w n e psychologist somewhere. He was a professor of philosophy. Very wise man. He got into a cycle, a, a phase of philosophy, which brought great depression on him. I think we should know the whole story. He got into the trap of a philosophy known as what? Existentialism. And when he told me the story, that was the first time I heard the word existentialism. I thought existentialism must be speaking of eternal life. Because existence, I know to be eternal, and if the ism is pertaining to that, then it must be <laughs> the ism of eternal life. <laughs> and then he told me the story. I said, I said what he said. He wrote a book, and uh, the book became very popular in the in the midst of all the psychologists in Canada and here in the states. So he he has no time for anything. He called for this conference and that conference. I said, "What did you write on that?" He said, "What is there to write? We see this flower is so beautiful, and this table is so nice, and this is so good, and everything seems to be so good and so fine. But look at that! Everything is changing, 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 dying, dying, dying." And this is what life is—a field of death, perpetual death. I said, "Do you call this existentialism? This is non-existentialism." And I said, "Now, come on, tell me what this this knowledge has done to your life." He said. I am not interested in anything because what I know is to be same, same, death, death. What is there to be interested about? And I said, "How do people in your family feel about such a thing that you are not interested in anything because you know everything to be same?" He said, "I don't mind what they think about me, but." Some one good friend of mine, a psychiatrist, he got interested in me, and he wanted to to give me some tablets. So, and he said this will take away my depression, and it will make me wake up in life and get me interested in life. And I said, did you take the tablets? He said, "No, I asked the doctor. He said, 'Doctor, don't give me tablet. Give me knowledge. It is not the tablet that is going to satisfy me. It's the knowledge that can wake me up or that can put me to sleep, whatever. But the knowledge, I want knowledge. Give me knowledge." I said, "Now you have come to the field of knowledge about life, and I said, what you are saying is partial value of life. You have absolutely realized life, but." Only in its partial phase. This is the nature of a relative life. What we say is changing, 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 changing. But there is another aspect to life, and which we call A B S O L U T E. This is the structure of that. Absolute. Even this word is relative. The word absolute itself is relative, but this is how we can talk about it. Something 
that is non-changing. He said, where is that? Show me. I said, this is a right inquiry. You see that everything is changing and everything is changing and everything is changing and therefore you have based the, uh, the whole structure of life on change and change and change and change. And if there is anything which may be said to be non-changing, it is, it is valid that it should be seen, it should be tested, it should be proved and found whether it really is. I said, fine. On how many levels you want it to see? And he, he got a little bit alert. I said, there are two levels of knowledge. One is intellectual understanding. The other is direct experience. Experience this is a rose. But cognizing a rose, seeing a rose like this, certainly I enjoy. But there is always an inquiry into the how and why of this. How this was developed, where was this grown, all about it, the history about it, and the utility of this with other aspects of life. So, intellectual understanding is a phase of knowledge which supports and enriches the direct experience. And direct experience is a phase of knowledge which brings significance to understanding about it. Both are complementary and supplementary to each other. Experience and understanding I said, from what you want to start? You want to start from intellectual understanding about the Absolute or want to have a direct cognition of it? He said, fine, I'll go for both. I said, fine. You say everything is changing. Do you believe really that everything is changing? I said, what is there to believe? It's obvious. Everything is changing. I said, do you feel that everything is always changing? He said, this is what I'm saying. Everything is always changing. Always, always. Ever, everything. I said, then everything is ever changing. He said, everything is ever changing. I said, this element of ever. That is called absolute. Something that always is, is isness, isness on the basis of which is thrives, and is thrives on the level of change, but on the bed of non-changing isness, which is ever eternal, immortal. Infinite. Just one angle given, and you could see that there is non changing at the basis of all changing. Because if the change is ever, if the relativity is to be relative, it has to be always, and that which is always is that which is not ending, which is not changing. So all the change that one sees, one sees on the basis of non-change. This is intellectual understanding about the Absolute. It takes half a minute to show intellectually. On the same ground of reasoning, that everything is changing. One word added to that, everything is always changing. And just that bringing the 
the pastor of all ways to one's notice and assault. All these scientific researches done by this scientist or that scientist or that scientist or that scientist, the phenomenon has ever been there. Who has not seen fruit falling from the tree and getting onto the earth? Newton saw it and he said, ah, oh, there is gravity. The phenomenon was there all the time. Who doesn't see apple falling on the ground? So, the recognition of truth does not mean that the truth is created. It's there. Only it is realized. And once it is realized, we start to make use of that knowledge for enriching our life. Here is the applied aspect of all these scientific formulas, gain, mathematical formulas, gain, through observing the phenomenon in nature. This thing, this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing. And this is the pursuit of science, to find out the reality of, of creation. Finer and finer, every branch of science is investigating some laws of nature. And always the quest is towards finer and finer, physics, chemistry, biology, astronomy, all are proceeding to investigate into the cause of the, of, of the surface value of life, getting into the cause of surface value of life. The phenomenon has always been there. It is there, only a matter of realizing it. The face of of, of that man, which was sung all the time in, in existentialism, found existence absolute at the basis of all his theories of all change and change. The face started to blow up right from that moment in half a minute when the ever was pointed out, that element of all ways pointed out. He said, now, intellectual understanding is clear. An intelligent mind he quickly grasped the whole thing. And now I said, now you will go to experience. I'll send you on to a lab work. He was initiated right away. And then what happened to him was, within two minutes, he started to laugh. And he laughed, and he laughed, and he laughed, and he laughed. Waves of joyfulness in his heart, waves and waves and waves. For 15 minutes he was laughing. <laughs> in a deep, dark room, even one candy can produce a glare, a dazzle in the eyes. Whole of his awareness was sunk in that gloomy mood of change and change and change, and life is just no good and no worse and nothing. All that gloomy. And we didn't know whether he actually transcended or not, but sure enough, he, he went a few steps into the settle, and that was enough for him to bring the waves of joyfulness. And when he narrated the whole thing to me, he said, I was feeling foolish within myself, but I didn't know how to restrict laughing. I, I didn't know how, why I was laughing, but I knew that I was laughing. <laughs> and 15 minutes, and this was due to the contrast, the great contrast. So, Never mind what a man has been so, so long, so far, till now. Let him start to meditate. His heart will swell in love, in happiness. His life will take a direction towards more progressive enlightenment. More progressive, more good. 
this is really awakening the reality of life from within. Really awakening the life. And for that, what was done? Nothing other than a few words of advice or that his mind may take be in a course. Very spontaneously. After initiation he came and he said, Mahati, tell me, what I experienced was, it was very wonderful and I laughed and I laughed and I laughed and I didn't know why I was laughing and there was no reason for that, but I laughed. But tell me, was it real? This question comes again from the, the, from the unreality of life having been fixed in the mind for so many years. That the life is unreal and the life is unreal. So he even starts to doubt his own experience. He feels good, feels happy, wants to confirm whether it is real happiness. Because he knows everything to be changing and on that basis of change he knows everything to be unreal. And now he started to laugh for the first time in his life, not speaking of his early days when he was a child and he was not gripped by this existentialism. As a child he must have been laughing a lot. But now he said, real, unreal. I said, now we'll an analyze whether it was real or unreal. I said, this is a flower. And uh, you open your eyes and what you find is a flower. And you open your eyes and what you find is a mic or a table. And... Perception is innocent. Perception, whatever perception, it is innocent. The experience is innocent. Innocent experience is real. If you are manipulating in your mind, that I am now going to see a flower, and I'm going to see a flower, and I'm going to see a flower, and here is the flower I see. This may be unreal vision of a flower. You may hypnotize yourself that I'm seeing something, and I'm seeing, and then you begin to see that thing. Such a sight will be unreal. And this will be the effect of putting yourself in, a, in that mood, and that you do to that mood, you see that that thing is there. But when you don't create any mood, when you are innocently perceiving, the object that you perceive must be there. And this vision can only be called real. Because you have not manipulated in your mind. That perception is not resulting from your previous thought. You started to meditate. You were given a word whose meaning even you were not told. And then you started to experience. And then what you experienced? He said, the word faded, faded. And I didn't know about the word and what I was doing was laughing. So, he experienced the word becoming fainter and fainter. And then what was there was a laughter wave of happiness, and one after the other, one after the other. I said, you never expected to laugh, or no, you were never thinking or feeling that now you are going to bliss consciousness and you are going to experience bliss. He said, no, none of these thoughts. When none of these thoughts, then the experience, whatever it was, was a genuine experience, innocent experience true experience, this laughter, this happiness, waves of happiness, is a reality of that area where your awareness went through that process you were instructed into. He said, yes. Then I said, this happiness is called bliss consciousness and belongs to the area of the absolute to which that ever belongs, the word ever, ever changing, ever changing. And then he was a wise man, he read a lot of Indian philosophy. Then I reminded him of some of the Upanishads which say, all this creation is born of ananda, it is sustained in ananda, it's all happiness. 
your happiness. And that region of your happiness is transcendental consciousness. So the moment awareness reaches that, one is filled with that quality. And that is that pure awareness, bliss consciousness. Then I said to him, now you see, this is real. The reality of this is the reality of the basic constituent of life. It is the basic constituent of creation. 